Hi, this is Doug Bradley, Pinhead from the Hellraiser movies, and you are listening to Without Your Head. And you'd better keep listening to Without Your Head, or you will not only be without your head, you will be without your soul, because I will tear it apart. Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neil. This is Annabelle Lecter. Yes, and we're joined by two incredible guests from the amazing film Baskin. We have uh, director Jean Evernall and the father, Mehmet Jera Olu. Which I Hello. know I'm right, but <laughs> Hello. 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 Yeah. Now, this movie's crazy, but it's an <laughs> it's it's amazing. Crazy in a in a in a wonderful way. Yes. So, uh, first of all, uh, Mehmet's here. How did Mehmet get involved in the movie? Mehmet Abi and I, uh, we met like um, during the short, the short film, and I was looking for a. Kind of like a extraordinary face to be to be just like like an extra on the film, and then mm-hmm. um, my cast director brought me a, a like a Mehmet Abi's photo, and then I was like, oh my god, this is uh, really interesting. I have to meet this guy. And then um, at, at the time we didn't have the time or money to like have a pre meeting, so he just showed up on the morning of the set, and we just met. And he's just like in a little like uh, one scene in the short film, but after that, like we became friends, and I understood that like um, he has like a really naive artistic soul, and he really appreciates like things much more than other people on the set usually does. And uh, when I was writing the film, I just had him on my mind for the father, and he has never acted before actually. He was never. He was never even like out of the country, or he was never even on a plane before we went to Sitges for the film's uh, Spanish premiere. Wow. Yes. So like so, he's really he's really like an outsider, amazing, unique soul. That's incredible. So how this person who found him for you? How did that even happen? If he hasn't done any of this stuff before. No. Uh, okay. The story goes. It's a crazy story, but like. Uh, Mehmet, by the way, I say Mehmet Abi because Mehmet Abi means kind of like brother Mehmet is like a Turkish way of like, uh, anyway, uh, he shows up to the mayor one day and says, mayor, look, I'm like, I'm healthy. I'm, uh, my mind is working. My arms are working. You know, like they just don't give me a job because of my physical appearance. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. The, and the mayor That's says, terrible. of course, of course, they, uh, especially like if you just consider like, uh, sometimes in Turkey, people are a bit uh, ignorant about these kind of things. So, mm-hmm. like, he really had, like, a tough life after, like, his childhood. And he has a rare skin condition, which makes him look the way he does. And it's, like, so rare. There's only, like, 15 known cases in the world from this. Wow. wow. And uh, anyway, the mayor says, of course they don't give you a job because you look like a spaceman. Like, he jokes about it. And then he says, how about I take you to the media? And then it sounds like an exploitation story, but actually the guy, like, in his own way, was really friendly with uh, Mehmet Abi, and like uh, he was on papers saying spaceman from Pendik, and Pendik is like uh, his hometown. Mm. So like uh, they find him, they find him like an arranged marriage uh, from his hometown, and they find him a job at the car park, and suddenly like uh, he has full grip on life, and like he says like he has full confidence, self confidence, which he he lacked before, and uh, being a really smart guy, he is. He goes to casting agencies and he just enlists on a casting agency on his own. I think that's like an amazing uh, move on his part. And 10 years later, my casting guy finds him because at the time I watched Evil Dead remake. And if you remember in the beginning of Evil Dead remake, there's a guy with a burned face. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I watched that. I said to my cast director, man, can we find like somebody like that? I know we don't have like... Uh, uh, quite sophisticated castings in Turkey where they would have like um, like a subsection for, for these type of things. But just let's try. And then he goes and tries and like one of the biggest casting agencies in Turkey, they have just a one A4 size sheet of paper with five people's photos on it. And one of them is Mehmet. Wow. That's how, so how old was he when he got basically his first job? 28. And now wow. he's 41. 
He started like after high school in 88, his mm -hmm. uh, business life. He was working as an assistant in a carpenter shop. In 98, he got married. And then after that, um, he got the job at the car park. And he's been there 18 years. When I met him, I went to interview him in his place. And like, it's really funny. In his place, there's like all these other guys. Uh, he says, they say like, whenever there's something goes wrong with the CCTV or with the, you know, uh, electronics or si stuff like Spaceman Brother Mehmet solves our problems. <laughs> <laughs> they all call him Spaceman Brother Mehmet there, which is really cool. And he, he was kind of like the, he was kind of like the, I don't know what's the proper word, but kind of like the mascot of his hometown. But mm -hmm. after this movie, he became even more like a local celebrity. And now he says, um, like, one out of two cars that come into his car park recognize him. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Uh -huh. it, but just to say that even, I, you know, I know he looks very different from uh, most people, but his acting is great. His presence is yeah, awesome. That even if he, he looked like Neil or you or anybody else... He's just his line delivery, his way he carries himself. It's just amazing. Thank you. So he says like he has he has it in him that like when he like starts a task, he really wants to go like a, he's a kind of like a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says it's in him that like when he's acting, he fully becomes that character and he loves becoming a, a different character. D during this movie, he loved becoming a different character. And we did like lots of rehearsals. And uh, in the rehearsal, he was always telling me, when we're actually shooting, I'm going to be better. And then he really was. Wow. wow. Another, another like, interesting trivia info for you. Uh, before we started rehearsing, um, I, I, me and Mehmet Abi, we watched some movies together. Like uh, I made him watch Hellraiser. I made him watch Nightmare on Elm Street, obviously trying to get him associated with these types of characters. But I also made him watch um, Apocalypse Now. Mm. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Colonel Kurtz, like we watched the, the last act uh, with Colonel Kurtz and uh, and he really enjoyed it and like what he, his feedback to me was amazing because he was saying uh, also like we should make the shadows like this as well, like we have to make the environment shadowy in order for this character to work, which is like coming from an outsider in terms of like business and arts from an outsider uh, actor, it was really impressive for me. Yeah, yeah. wow. That's a good comparison because uh, that character, even though he's doing horrible things in uh, in Apocalypse Now, he's also very loving to all his uh, his followers there, just like the father character. Exactly, in, yeah. In yeah. The now, fanatic. Did you did you write the the character of the father for Mehmet, or was that in the uh, in the short and in the feature before you met him? I mean, it wasn't the, the character wasn't in the short. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I'm very interested with cults and I'm in, very interested with Jim Jones or um, Colonel Kurtz type of characters which kind of like um, take his followers and just like uh, take them to their doom but he does it with conviction rather than like being uh, a tyrant so I mean it was just something that I was like uh, kind of like thinking about but after I me met Mehmet Abi like it was always in my mind his face was when I was writing the script it was always his face in my mind mm -hmm. So do you write the character specifically to suit suit him Yes yes actually I mean um I, when I sent him the script I was kind of um I had my doubts that maybe he was going to like say there's no way I'm going to play in this vile shit <laughs> <laughs> no, like um, when I sent him the script, he sent me back uh, some drawings. I don't know if I like. Uh, I don't know if you like, came across those yeah, drawings. Yeah, those on him. his Facebook. Yeah, look. Let me just show you a couple more. Like you All keep right. asking, and then in the meantime, I'm gonna bring bring a booklet. All right, I'll take some screenshots. Yeah. I mean, he was like uh, sending me all these amazing drawings from the from the script. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, we did like a nice uh, exhibition. Look, can you see? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, right. and like, I can send you these photos as well. But like, uh, it was really, I was really impressed by how he uses the frame full on and his different like choice of colors and, it, and like his attention to detail. And like, considering he has no arts education, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is this guy is a creative genius, basically. Yes. <laughs> He's yeah. really uh, just a natural. That's amazing. It's amazing. 
I mean, not even seeing it. I could tell just by, I mean, this is what you do. You, you enjoy making films. You're a visual person. And for you to have such regard for it that you would, you know, go grab it and be proud of it for him. Yes. It says a lot. <laughs> yes. Now, what did Mehmet think when he read the script originally? He was, he, first of all, he was really glad and like he felt privileged that he was offered a script. And then he first he read it as a story, just a story. And then uh, he read it again, just analyzing his character. Uh, he, he, he goes again about the, the, the paintings that like he started mm-hmm. painting some scenes and like uh, he was so happy because I was so surprised. I didn't know that he was drawing. And then like as I was more surprised and I was more happy, he started sending me more paintings. And then after a while, he was a bit like there was a phase where he was really kind of afraid and uh, because like uh, he says, like, this is such a central character to the movie. Uh, it's it's kind of like the star of the movie. And like mm-hmm. he has no experience. If he fails, all the responsibility will be on his shoulders. So uh, he was kind of like um, uh, a bit hesitant about it. But then like he regained his confidence. Uh, it was a, like this movie is like a kind of a turning point for him in his life. Until he got married, until the age of 28, he was a very introvert person. He, he, he didn't have much self-confidence. And it was a very valuable experience for him because that it uh, provided him a, a chance to explore his uh, artistic side, which he always knew that existed, existed within himself. But he was never given a chance to put it um, on the paper or on the on the screen anywhere. So after this movie, uh, now like he's working at the car park still, but like uh, in his mind, he's always thinking about the movie and he wants to do some more acting. Excellent. I should hope so because he's he was awesome. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, welcome. <clears throat> now, really, the whole cast I thought was great, and I assume the uh, the people played the policemen or. or uh, you know, veteran actors, especially like the boss character and stuff. And so when Mehmet's uh, interacting with him, a lot of the movie is, you know, just one-on-one dialogue. Uh, what was that like for him to work with, you know, actors who have such experience? He was really focused on his own character and he really didn't uh, care for other actors' experience or not. Uh, and he thought this should be the attitude for him to approach his work in the first place. So he didn't care if they were just extras or some experienced actors. He just treated them all the same. And he was more focused on his character and how his character would interact with these other characters. Mm -hmm. It seems like the smart way to go to not ever get intimidated by someone else's experiences to just worry about yourself and trust that they're going to care about their job as much as he does. Yes, yes. Um, Also, as you may uh, see in the behind the scenes uh, which is going to be in the Blu-ray and DVD, which is coming out in the U.S. in, I think, early August or something. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can check on IFC Midnight's webpage. Uh, there's a 17-minute behind-the-scenes documentary where uh, actors and Mehmet Abi and me and D.O.P., like, we're talking about the movie a little. There, like, some of the actors say that we, they were really intimidated by the situation that they're going to be playing against this non-actor. But once he started acting, they were all very uh, happy and everybody was happy on the stay on the set mm-hmm. now we saw the pictures that uh that Mehmet drew the, the art um now you already had you know the vision of the movie in your mind and everything but did any of his art influence any of the scenes for you when you're filming it um not really but like um kind of like made me uh even like uh work more enthusiastically with Mehmet Abi. In that, in that case, it really worked a lot. And also, um, many people, when they see Mehmet Abi's drawings, they, they think he did them after the movie because they're so similar to some of the scenes in the movie. But, um, and that, all, that also shows you his attention to the detail of the script, in the script and the way he delivered. Uh, but... It's, I think it's also a bit beyond that. Like, it's really interesting how similar some of the shots in the movie are to his paintings. Yeah. So I would think in your mind, like, this guy really understands what I'm trying to get across in this movie. For sure. For sure. Definitely. Mm-hmm. So for both of you, what's your, what's your previous experiences with horror? He hasn't done acting, but as far as his interests and for you yourself as a filmmaker. Um, for him, um, he told me that, like... Uh, he told me he watched Beauty and the Beast when he was a young kid. 
And he said, oh, my God, this is my movie. You know, uh, just the bare fact that um, he picks up on that is like beautiful, I think. But also I, ask, I can ask him. He could never imagine like being in a horror film ever before. And even like um, in the 10 years before <clears throat> we worked with him, there were a couple of projects that approached him. Uh, but his scenes were either cut or he didn't make it to the final audition. Uh, but they were all comedies. Mm-hmm. So until I approached him, like it, it never crossed his mind uh, to be associated in a horror film. But he says like he watched lots, lots of horror films in his time because like um, foreign horror, especially, was big in Turkey during the VHS era. Uh, so he did watch like. Uh, but let me ask him if he has any favorites. Like uh, yeah. yeah, he says, uh, "Freddy, that guy with the knives in his hand." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Nightmare on Elm Street. The the werewolf in London. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, 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 yeah which is apparently uh, American Werewolf in London. Awesome. How about yourself? I assume uh, you were always a horror movie fan. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, um, it's it's kind of interesting. I was always uh, I was always interested with dark uh, kind of literature, and uh, for instance, like at the age age of seven, I loved Iron Maiden and Metallica and Motley Crue, just based on their uh, kind of dark music, but also based based on their cover art, you know. <laughs> Because like uh, I don't know during eight during the eighty eight eighty nine times I just used to go to the record store shop and I was just like there isn't even like a you couldn't even listen to them so I would just pick by whichever uh, cover I like and I used to like go for Man Hour because I like Conan I like um, Iron Maiden because I like Eddie and then like um, um, horror films specifically kind of really horrified me when I was a kid imagine like even Goonies made me so scared I had to turn it off during the scene when Sloth is like tied to the chair in front of the TV. Uh-huh. It was pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, so like, as a kid, like my friends would be, you know, what the hell, they don't like really, they're not really, uh, they, they're just amused. But I was so um, intensely, uh, you know, terrified by any kind of horror. So like my, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep for days and my parents like finally said, okay, no more horror films. And I didn't, I didn't rebel because I didn't want to watch horror films as well. They were too. <laughs> it was a good excuse. Oh, my parents said I can't watch them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but like, uh, but I was always like um, interested in horrific computer games and uh, you know lots of gory imagery, everything. Uh, but kind of like horror films, especially when you grow up in the '90s, where thriller is the most. Uh, more mainstream horror so b-movie horrors has been it was kind of being ashamed of you know Mm -hmm. it wasn't a cool thing like horror b-movies in the 90s it was more about uh hannibal lecter and uh it was more about uh basic instinct and that type of thrillers so um but i was a big movie buff and after age of 17 18 after exploring more hardcore art house films like haneke gaspar noe and then like more taboo breaking stuff with like rape and this and that. And then I've uh, made my way to horror B movies. And then I discovered Toby Hooper, uh, John Carpenter, Cronenberg, Lynch. And then I say, oh, some of these films I watched as a kid, not really as a horror film, but like more like a thriller. And then it kind of like got me like a renaissance. Like I rediscovered all these horror classics. So that's my kind of story. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, you said that uh, horror movies were big in Turkey in the 80s. How about yeah. Turkish-made movies? Uh, are there a lot of horror movies made in Turkey? It was it's like this. like In the 70s, there's a crazy era of like Turkish movies, which is like kind of like Bollywood with a lower production quality. And they were having like over like 300, 400 films a year in the 70s. And they have all these like Turkish Batman, Turkish Star Wars, Turkish this, Turkish Rambo, Turkish that, you know. A- anything but when it comes to serious horror i don't know why it's still baffling to me we don't have horror films and then like after the military coup in the eight, 1980 uh turkish cinema died completely there was like mm-hmm. uh, five six films made every year and when i was growing up the term turkish film was used for ridiculing something you know if there was <laughs> something like really ridiculous you say oh that's like a turkish film so only in the mid 90s and towards the end of 90s suddenly there was a redevelopment and then now there's again a boom there's a huge boom which is really disturbing to me because like there are very shallow comedies and shallow mafia movies uh just cheap tv production quality uh no composition blocking sound design just 
just straight out shallow films. And um, so in that sense, also like in the last 10 years, there's a share of Turkish horror films, which are almost 100% all religion themed. Mm -hmm. And they're more like, uh, uh, you know, they are even when like things like, um, they're not really anti-status quo rebellious horror films, which the way kind of like you and I like, but they're more like, uh, you know, how you say like like pro religion pro religion finger uh don't do bad things things bad things will happen to you exactly you know there are things beyond science there are things beyond this that it's like more much like patriarchal uh uh macho and pro religion pro uh nation kind of like attitude which is that's what that's why you don't know any of those films and i doubt you would enjoy them but having said that there are a couple of ones lately. Maybe like you can find some like B movie um, thing in them you can enjoy. But I don't know. You mentioned you know a lot of Turkish films having uh, low production uh, quality, and uh, your movie just looks fantastic. And I don't know what the budget is on it or anything, but um, would I assume that's a lot different than than a, a normal Turkish film? And how did you get the budget for the movie? How did how did it all come about? I mean, um, there's a huge gap between um, these shallow uh, box office uh, comedies and very art house uh, festival winning films. Like every year, if you go to Cannes or Berlinale or Sundance, every year there's one or two Turkish films and like they're winning awards as well. But they're not distributed. They don't get the distribution they deserve and they don't really meet the audience. You know, uh, festival films and uh, box box office films, they have a huge gap. So... It's not that, like, there are lots of beautiful-looking Turkish films, but then again, those films are targeted for festivals only, and they're more or less all <clears throat> cut from the same cloth, being, like, Tarkovsky-like, very slow, art house. Um, so that's why there's no genre film. There's no nothing in between. And we approached Baskin as, like, an indie filmmaking attitude, but working with a, with a good... Uh, commercial crew because I do TV commercials and the budget is only it's only like uh, $300,000 it looks more yeah but yeah. it's only $300,000 and that budget is uh, we set up like um, we produced it independently I mean through my family and uh, my mom actually <laughs> and she's an architect we have an architecture company and she kind of like uh, risked half of our savings, our family savings, for this movie. Wow! I mean, we're not we're not super rich that we have like uh, three times amount of the money that we spent for Baskin on the bank as yeah. a backup. It, he, she literally spent half of uh, her savings for this, and uh, but she really likes my work and trusted me. And X Y Z Films uh, played a big role in convincing my family that there's a international audience for this film outside of Turkey. So don't worry about censorship. Don't worry if Turkish audiences don't get this. Just make your film kind of guidance. Did your mom know what this movie was about before she put the money in? Yeah, I mean, my mom uh, was telling me uh, like a child version uh, of Alien as a bedtime story when I was a kid. And like, <laughs> she, she loves Fellini, she loves Kubrick, she loves Hitchcock. Uh, your mom's and, cool yeah she's she's cool. like both my parents they really respect high art uh, horror films but what they couldn't get for years is my passion for B movies mm -hmm. uh, I mean it took me a while to tell my father why and how I enjoy uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and uh, but when I made him watch it finally he really enjoyed it and uh, actually I made them watch everything from Eraserhead to Pink Flamingos to story of Ricky all everything and yeah they kind of know like my work anyway mm -hmm. now um, you'd mentioned the a lot of the horror movies that come out now were like uh, pro-religion and stuff like that so what what has been the reaction in Turkey to your film Baskin um, the reaction has been mixed uh, the critics critics 90% of the critics they really loved it and hailed it Um an audience that we have lots of fans, uh, like we have people tattooing this film, 
like oh, I, I have this crazy fan on Snapchat who tattooed this uh, Baskin on his arm. And wow, uh, wow. yeah, we have many, many fans, but also we have many, many haters uh, mm-hmm. saying this film is vile against Turkish family values. Uh, there is no plot to this film. You know, th- there is no proper script. Uh, all kinds of criticisms, as you might imagine. And there's a huge backlash from the conservative uh, audiences. But still, it's baffling to me that this film played uncut over 45 cities in Turkey, especially like in some eastern cities over the border of Syria, Iraq, Iran. And uh, this film played uncut, you know, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. quite crazy. Yeah. yeah. What, is, uh, what is it normally like over there for this kind of film or, or anything just as far as censorship? Um, TV censorship is bonkers, really. It's like almost like North Korea now. Uh, I'm, I'm making a joke. It's not like North Korea, but like, you know what I mean? Uh, but if you watch First Blood, when he's stitching himself up, the blood is, the, the wound is pixelated. Oh, wow. And when you watch True Detective, uh, the alcohol and tobacco products are pixelated. Any kind of sexual content is cut. Uh, any kind of sexual content is not translated in the subtitles and um and imagine when i was a kid we had basic instinct on primetime tv so unfortunately in the last 15 years just like many other parts of the world turkey has also gone more and more conservative Mm -hmm. and it's still a battle up and down up and down battle uh and um but it's not that strict uh with cinemas because people don't go to cinemas as they used to, unfortunately, because uh, there's lots of piracy, plus there's lots of uh, TV series, which is like also like a trend in the world, as you know. Independent mm-hmm. films are kind of like um, losing the battle against TV series. So because of many reasons, uh, TV, cens- uh, TV censorship is much worse than uh, cinema censorship. And in the cinemas, as far as I know, other than Nymphomaniac, uh, we don't have any uh, censored or banned films. I mean, you have uh, old Saw films. They are very popular here. Why? What makes the movie, What makes Baskin so personal to you? The story. What makes it? Because I, I had the luxury to write a script and shoot a film, however I, I wanted. You know, so uh, in that sense, any type like it's my kind of editing. It's my kind of story. My kind of atmosphere. My kind of sense of humor. My kind of anything. So. In that sense, it's very personal. Also, um, I just wanted to make a film, like a Turkish festival film, and then I just wanted to crash that into a Twilight Zone and twist the genre halfway through the movie and also make it like a Mobius ending, very lots of loose ends, um, lots of symbolism, and lots of um, what-the-fuck kind of situations. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And also it's about a little little kid. It's about nightmares, which is kind of like a very big focus in my life. I have lots of nightmares. And yeah. I don't, how is hell seen in Turkey? And is anything in Baskin like related to any type of folklore in Turkey itself? Or is it just all out of your mind? No, no not at all. It's more about Lovecraft than Turkish thing. But I can ask Mehmet Abi about how hell is received in Turkey. Yeah. I mean, in Turkish culture, in Islamic culture, hell is uh, just like Christianity. Hell is a place you go after you die, and it's uh, it's mostly associated with being burned in flames. Um, but the, the hell in the movie is completely different. But uh, Mehmet Abi says the hell in the movie is the hell of those five characters. It's like, um, in a way, it's their purgatory. What what does the father character represent to, to Mehmet? He's a leader of the fallen, uh, in the sense that like fallen angels, kind of, and also he's the nightmare of uh, he's the nightmare of Arda. Arda being the young kid, like the the, the main guy. Mm-hmm. Why would he think that these these poor creatures, these human beings, would finally? succumb to what his desires are all the people we see crawling around and raping each other and being just craziness um his answers are amazing sometimes he says uh there's it's very personal to him the character father because there i mean he can't 
relate some personal connections with his life and this because um, he sees all those father's sons in, or father's children in the movie as fallen people and uh, outcasts and outcasts in real life as well he says they have like complex they, they have inferiority complexes and they have like all these kind of like things so uh, they uh, they search for happiness elsewhere and here all these fallen angels all these fallen people, all these outcasts are looking up to Father as a source of happiness. They're mm -hmm. trying to like uh, look out at the world, world without their eyes through their uh, sense of, you know, like in the movie it says like open your uh, mind to me. So they're like trying to like look out at, at the world like through their minds, but actually they're, but actually it's apparent that they are in a hellish situation without um, f being fully aware of. Just thought, what are some of Mehmet's favorite uh, scenes in the movie? Cops dancing in the van. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good scene because it does, you know, it helps you connect to the characters and then you care more about, you know, what happens to them later on in the film. Yeah. Just, uh, one of my personal favorite scenes is actually when he, he bathes it in, uh, in the blood after, uh, after, he kills, after he cuts the throat of the boss. I thought that was a great scene. Yeah, he said, like, there's lots of, like... Uh, all that stage blood going into his eye, it was kind of like painful for him. So he said like he asked the, the art department what that uh, material was. And once he knew that it was safe to be swallowed or anything, he a tried to be extra disgusting on the set like, to be as cr <laughs> crazy as possible. Nope. It really works. <laughs> it's it's so excellent. How did you guys feel uh, when you first saw it with an audience? When you went well, when you went to a premiere for it, and you got the reactions of your crowd, how was it? Um, the cast and crew screaming was more like, uh, "Wow, we did an amazing job!" But people didn't really connect with the film in a way. I think like not everybody. I mean like. But like many people were more puzzled than uh, amazed. I mean, both amazed and puzzled. Let's say, let's put it that way, because um, ninety percent of the cast and crew uh, they wouldn't know Shining or Hellraiser. They are a bit alien to this kind of culture, you know. Or say David Lynch, or um, you know, you know those kind of yeah, films yeah. or those kind of literature. So in a way, they were a bit puzzled. They are more used to like watching films, which give you exactly what you want, like uh, something jolly, very manualistic. Yeah, jolly, jolly ride through this scenario type of thing. But when we had a screening, like in Sitges, which was kind of like a big um, premiere for us, when we screened in Sitges, it was amazing, and everybody was like, uh, they were like clop, they were. Um, I mean, the reaction in Sitges, like 1,200 people or 1,400 people, it was amazing. They applauded for, for a long time. Everybody came for asking for autographs. It was amazing. And this was your first full-length feature, wasn't it? Yes. Wow. And so also, also in the first Turkish uh, festival screening, uh, there were some celebrities in the audience because everybody like heard about the hype in Toronto and in Austin and like we sold the film to America and it is only the eighth Turkish film ever to be sold to the States. Wow. And uh, so there was a there was a hype and like everybody just came to see this successful movie but they didn't know what it was about. So there were like <laughs> many walkouts. Actually like in all Turkish screenings there are lots of walkouts which is um, kind of like makes my day. But <laughs> in, our, in, in the Turkish festival screening there was this one celebrity like kind of like walked out and <clears throat> uh, when he saw us he was like uh, he was terrified and he says he apologized he apologized but he said it's too much for him and we took a photo with him and put it on twitter oh that's great at least he was really good about it yeah, <laughs> yeah they actually showed uh, the movie at a theater near us in boston at the coolidge did you ever think that the movie would you know be seen internationally and, and play well with with uh, audiences in, in other countries? Yes, that was my intention, actually. Uh, because with my short films, I've been to Fright Fest and Fantastic Fest and Sitges many times. Not many times, but like two times. <laughs> uh, and then I went there to watch other films. 
And then I knew the crowd, I knew the kind of films, so I knew that like if I want to, if I kind of like uh, successful in making the kind of film that I want to make, there was an audience for this, and uh, I was expecting it to be kind of like reaching to audiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. Did you limit yourself making this at all? Were there any scenes that you wanted and thought, I can't do that? Or did you just feel, I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing? And maybe maybe the, the, the father's cult. I would have them completely naked. Yeah. Um, but once we started covering their faces, it kind of like didn't bother me. Because like um, half, of that, half of that team... They were okay with being completely naked. And some of them in some scenes are. Uh, but the other half were kind of like they didn't want to be. So like I was like uh, kind of juggling it in my mind. How will I get get around this when the, the time comes? But like when the time came, uh, the costumes and the amount of blood and uh, the eyes being covered and everything was pretty cool. So I said like, you know what? Like we don't need to make them all naked. Like it's, it's like it's not, it doesn't bother me that much. So just we just went with it. Yeah, they look great. I think the their grubbiness certainly <laughs> helps help sell the whole thing. And they've got like you know the cloths around their face, and that the the cloth I think helps carry the filth. Yeah. <laughs> where where was that scene uh, filmed? Was that like a set built, or was that on, on location somewhere? It's a crazy location. It's uh, it's a uh, in a very conservative part of town actually, and so it was quite a mission to get all those uh, blood covered actors. To a close by bath. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there are lots of crazy stories there, uh, but it's uh, it's an old it's an old like a couple hundred years old um, kind of like a depot, like a Byzantine from the maybe maybe Byzantine. They t- told us it was Byzantine, but maybe Ottoman. I don't know. It was like a oh, depot which wasn't used for years. Mm-hmm. So, where are a few of your said stories? <laughs> he says the first thing, first thing that comes up to his head is like the the cold it was so cold oh because like we had to shoot this film like uh in 26 days 26 nights no day shoots actually 26 nights and it was either mostly in te- exterior shots or even the interiors are, are kind of like ruins so <laughs> it was very windy and it was very cold and uh especially the father and the father's cult they don't have nothing on uh, like they don't have warm clothes, and it was it was December in Turkey, which is kind of like December in New York type of thing. Ooh. Yeah, that's how it is around here. We're we're that same temperature through uh, through the winter, and I I can't really imagine how terrible that would be to be wearing less than a bathing suit <laughs> and covered in probably things that are wet. <laughs> and like uh, as you say, like stories from the set for me. Every single day, we had like a, a mountain to climb because every single day, uh, we had something that the crew had never s- experienced before. Yeah. Either either uh, um, like naked people on the set or a uh, disembowelment scene or a non-actor giving a speech for the first time or uh, crashing a car into a river. Um, you know, every day, we had a crazy scene which was like, I mean, I... Came home every day very happy, but always very nervous the next morning, going like kind of like stressed, but it was like a beautiful stress every morning, not every afternoon, actually. So this must be just so incredible for you to see this has turned out as well as it has, because it could have really all gone totally wrong. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like everything fell into place. Yeah, I'm super happy. So, but during during the production, we kind of like we were super happy. And uh, we kind of said, okay, this is going to be good. This is going to be, this is not going to be a failure. So, and like when I, when I made the rough cut and watched it for the first time, I said, you know what? Like, I think I expressed myself good enough in this film. So I'm happy. What's uh, um, the reaction been uh, from uh, either the police or people who support the police? Because one of the policemen in the beginning of the movie is not, you know, represented as a very nice guy. Yeah, I mean, um, Mehmet Abi has some like uh, friends who are cops, and he didn't get any negative reaction from them. I mean, some people obviously didn't like the film at all, but like they all congratulated him for his acting, so he was really happy. But like coming back to your question, yes, we didn't have like any major complaints from any government or police um, 
and I was kind of expecting some, mm -hmm. but I don't know, it's like since the, like the movie became very successful when it, it was released in Toronto, uh, it kind of like, um, you know, like things work in like, it, the, the way things work in Turkey is kind of like uh, different. And once your stuff is uh, successful outside, people are more impressed and they have a positive prejudice against it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. maybe that's, maybe that's, or maybe like people didn't see uh, behind the, the horror and people um, didn't really like see the political side of the film in a broader yeah. text. So, but like the DVD is coming out only next month and it's going to be more available to like many more audience uh, people. So like, I th maybe like it's going to be <laughs> more reactions after that. Mm -hmm. So considering that our audience is, is a lot of United States and, and European folks and don't have the appreciation for the history and culture of Turkey, obviously, as much as people who are natives. Can you put a context to this film that maybe we otherwise would not perceive? Yes. Maybe like maybe it can kind of translates through the film or not, I'm not sure, but like uh cops in Turkey, they can get away with pretty much anything. Hmm. Um they're like, you know, Mexican cops or Brazilian cops, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So um and right up until the 80s uh, until the 90s actually there was a law saying that you can never you can never insult or um, make a bad image for Turkish police in a film wow. wow so in that environment and also considering the considering the censorship in TV considering our crazy president and considering the the political um, at atmosphere like this level of uh, extremity in the movie is never be, something never been done in Turkey. So, like, but in an interesting, crazy way, it didn't create such a negative reaction. So, yeah, it's just like an interesting case. So it's pretty groundbreaking. You've really um, not just made an excellent film for yourself uh, and personal reasons, but filmmakers probably can now feel that things have opened up for them in terms of possibilities. Yes, to but do like, work they couldn't not make. right away. Because they're like uh, young guys, young short, short filmmakers. Uh, they're like sending me their short films and like they're thanking me at the end of their short films. And there's like uh, lots of people who, who are really appreciating this movie. But in terms of like a filmmaking culture, this movie is like an island on its own. Mm. Really, people don't really know what to make of it, I think. That's the bigger... That's how I feel about it. Yeah. To me, that's a kind of a movie I would enjoy, where you watch it, and it's not just black and white, or doesn't just tell you what's happening. You, you It makes you think about the movie, and what's going on, and what, what everything means. Yeah. Now, where is this movie taking you guys, uh, yourself and Mehmet? You talked about Toronto and... Uh, where's uh, where have you guys watched a movie? You know, at uh, at festivals. We went to Sitges, Spain, to the world's biggest fantastic film festival. <laughs> um, he went to Austria for Vienna. There's a film festival there, and then he went to some like uh, Turkish other towns like Eskişehir and Antalya. And then I personally went to 18 countries actually. Wow! Wow! wow. Yeah, I went like um, Toronto, Austin, Montreal, LA, Mexico, Stockholm, Tel Aviv, uh, Bilbao, um, Germany, like, yeah, quite a lot. And then the film played over 45 festivals so far. Wow. And I know you won uh, Best uh, New, was it Best New Director or just Best Director at the Fantastic Fest? It's a best director award, but it's only given to first or second time filmmakers. Okay. So, uh, where do you have that? Do you get like an actual trophy? I assume. You want me to show you? Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, like Austin Fantastic Fest trophy is like it's not very impressive, but well, it's the first time I'm showing my awards <laughs> to somebody over Skype. So this is the Fantastic Fest mug. For the best filmmaker, which That's is very cool, take a Stein. Kinda, I was kind of hoping for something 
a bit more, I don't know. It's a mug, like a coffee mug? Yeah, it's like a stein. Like a oh, beer, gotcha. Yeah. Beer mug. I, if you're a, a beer drinker in Texas, it's probably the best <laughs> thing you could ever want in the world. I mean, like, I other than a gun. Previously, uh, previously, they have, like, um, when you win the award, they call you to the stage and you drink uh, with this, and then they give you the 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 jug but for the first time i don't know why they didn't do it this year Aww. but any, anyway fantastic fest is my, one of my all time favorite festivals anyway fantastic fest and sitges i think those two are my favorites for mm -hmm. sure and then this is uh, morbido it's a blood red skull this is director's award in uh, mexico that's really cool that's really cool i don't know if you know morbido but like it's the the best uh, film festival in South America and Mexico. And this is from Bilbao for the best director. It's kind of like a huge nail in the coffin type of thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how did uh, you get involved with IFC Midnight to distribute the movie? When, when Colin Geddes in Toronto, when he picked it up for Midnight Madness, mm -hmm. It kind of like all went downhill, uphill from that. Like I, I never like spoke to any other. Like uh, I didn't have to submit it to anywhere after that. Um, X Y Z sold it to IFC Midnight, and after Toronto, all the rest of the festivals they just asked uh, for the film. But it was mainly X Y our, our sales agent X Y Z Films being uh, the guys like putting it out there. And it's a, it's a, it's an interesting story because with my very first short film, The Chest. Um, Todd Brown was the first ever foreign uh, blogger to write something about it and at the time he was writing a Twitch film and he just like wrote a, like a one single paragraph a couple of sentences but it was very precious for me and as the year passed I did another short film and then another short film and then another and like and then he like uh, climbed up the ladder and like he became XYZ films and um, so yeah, he was the one who told me after my sixth short film, like, if you do a feature film like your short films, I think we know an audience for you. And uh, he made me sign a first option before the film, uh, before the, the shooting, actually. But as you said, like, if I had, um, after the shooting, if I had failed, and if I had, like, uh, showed him, like, a bad movie, right, probably right. <laughs> he was going to say, okay, let me get back to you. <laughs> and then that was going to be the end of it. But he was really happy. When I showed him the rough cut, uh, he told me that he's going to get back to me in a couple of days. And we were at Berlin Film Festival then. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, at 1 a.m., he started tweeting, oh, my God, this is Fulci Argento, <laughs> da, da, da. Like, he was so happy about it. Yeah. Wow. yeah. How do those comparisons make you feel? I mean, that's pretty much as good as it gets. I'm not, yeah, obviously, it makes me super proud. But I'm kind of like, kind of... They say good artists kind of steal. So I'm kind of like stealing bits and bobs from here and there. And even now, like I'm gearing up for my next feature film. Like I have like a notebook with my, on my hand. Like every time, um, every time I watch a movie or it's like a painting, anything that inspires me, I can take notes. And maybe I can use this in this scene, in that scene. Uh, your next film, is it going to be a horror film? Yes, I can send, send you an article. Like if you just type on Google... Uh, housewife Evrenol, my name with housewife. Nice. Uh, it, it comes up. Uh, it's going to be in English language. It's going to be shot in Istanbul. So, and hopefully it's going to be like my first fe English language feature film. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Great. Uh, will you and Mehmet work again together? If not necessarily in this one, but in the future. Of course we want to. He says that's his all his ex, uh, expectation. <laughs> he wants to retire from uh, being a car park attendant, and he wants to act. That, yeah, I, I think that's a wise decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's kind of like uh, he's kind of not disappointed, but he's a bit upset that like uh, there has been so much attention, but people don't uh, come and offer him a role already. But I try to tell him this is the nature of this type of things, mm -hmm. and. But once yeah. it, it could be different once the actual the DVD comes out and the Blu-ray. That's true. And, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd love to see him at a convention. I think that would be... Uh, I know that it's a long distance for... Well, maybe there's some out there that he could do. I don't know. But uh, horror movie conventions, I think he would do very well at. 
especially once the movie gets out there more. I mean, once the movie, once the DVD and Blu-ray comes out in the U.S. as well, if such a such a demand comes, uh, we would be over the moon, and I'm sure like he would love to make the trip over there. I hope that happens one day. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I don't know if you can say anything quick about a housewife. What, what what's the uh, like? What's the premise? Um, okay, housewife. Again, again, it's a film about madness and paranoia and nightmares. And this time there's a female lead and I had enough with macho energy in Baskin. Mm-hmm. So I want to have some like uh, more female energy this time. And it's funny, like all my short films and all my like my, my and Baskin, I always like uh, want to do something sexy and something with like beautiful women and really kinky. And then I end up with like uh, tough guys and monsters. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know why. But this time. Again, it's not like a very kinky or erotic film, but there's going to be like a, there's going to be like a, a more female atmosphere to it. And then it's about a woman who was traumatized as a kid when her mom uh, tried to kill her, and years later, uh, she is kind of battling with the still battling with her nightmares. And her husband wants a kid, and she doesn't want a kid. And then like she meets an international psychic, mind reader guy. And then after her interaction with this mind reader guy, she slowly kind of loses the line between reality and nightmares. And the film is kind of like going with a very crazy, um, as you can imagine, like Baskin, the film kind of goes crazy towards the end. Mm-hmm. I'm really confused. Really Sounds more. great. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And there's like lots of, uh, we're drawing many um, ideas from um, Argento and Fulci again. I think it will be more Argento esque this time. Mm-hmm. Now, how how can people see your other shorts? Are, are they available online or anywhere? Um, yeah, if they go to my webpage, mm-hmm. JanEvrenol.com, like CanEvrenol.com. If they type my name on Google, it just comes up. Okay. And on my webpage, you have all my short films and other work. Oh, fantastic! Uh, I'm going to uh, check those out. And also, like. Uh, Maybe they can check out this this little video called Pencil, and I did it. I did it. It's like a no budget uh, thirty second video. I did it for Fright Fest. It's like a, just like a turn off your mobile phone video, but it quite it caused quite a stir at the time, and there was uh, such a negative uh, backlash from Huffington Post and like many other like uh, things, and Fright Fest had to pull it offline. Really? So this is the pencil turn off your bloody phone? Yes. All right. All right. Yeah, it's very easy to find. Pencil, like for people listening, a writing utensil pencil, Fright Fest. It's right there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like a joke. <laughs> well, why did it cause such an uproar that they had to take it off? Um... Because it's off- they said it's very off- it's offensive to women and it's uh, offensive to uh, Batman theater shootings, oh, which no. is completely Ooh, ridiculous. Cool. I think. Now I wouldn't. No, just, 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 right just because I made like a thirty second uh, short film um, in a theater, right after. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, it's just ridiculous. I don't want to comment on it even. Yeah. yeah. You make it. You watch it and make your own decision. I think um, you'll see what I mean. I'm actually watching it right now because I feel the need. <laughs> <laughs> because I know it's 37 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> I have to say. Uh-huh. I think the point is made. Don't yeah. be on your cell phone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I saw some more offensive stuff in Austin uh, Fantastic Film Festival uh, phone idents, which are notorious and amazing. And like at the time when I took this to Fright Fest, uh, to London, I was kind of embarrassed that oh people are not going to laugh, you know, they're not going to be amazed. But like it played midnight slot right before Maniac remake, and like uh, people uh, were like people were like laughing and still giggling, like even when the, the opening credits were for Maniac were like uh, running. <laughs> it's great, it's great. <laughs> and that movie's wonderful. I don't know what you thought of the new Maniac, but I really enjoyed it. For someone who really is. Uh, hesitant about many remakes, modern remakes. 
I really enjoyed I it. Completely yeah. agree. It's such a loyal to the spirit and totally different. And like I, th I thought, like there's no way Elijah Wood is gonna do justice mm -hmm. to the amazing. I don't remember his name, but the amazing actor in the first movie. But it's perfectly. It makes beautiful sense. Like I loved it. It's a great movie. Yeah, they actually, I think, uh, really used Elijah. You know, if they just re if they just did Maniac and had the same character, it wouldn't work with Elijah. But uh, they changed the character to fit Elijah, and I thought it was a it's it's a really great movie. Yeah. And honestly, I think if they did, uh, his name is Joe Spinell, I believe. Yeah. 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 And, and if they ones. picked a, a guy with a very similar physical appearance, I think it would have felt like, why even bother to remake it if you're going to just carbon copy it? No, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but but the, the, the visual approach was so different and cutting edge and beautiful. I think still with a, like a similar kind of lead, it would be good. But like when they made it first person... Then they kind of could. They were able to get away, get away with it. I think, and especially there's this one scene where you see Elijah Wood's reflection on the car, which is actually the poster from the first movie. Uh -huh. That kind of uh -huh. like uh, that 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 was amazing. Yeah, which uh, that's which, still uh, one of my favorite posters uh, for a horror movie, the original Maniac. I think it's uh, it's fantastic. Here, uh, so uh, how can people uh, f uh, you know follow you online to see what you guys are up to next and about the movie? Uh, baskinthemovie.com also on Facebook and Twitter if you just hashtag baskinthemovie we're very easily reachable and uh, I can spell Mehmet Abi's um, Twitter for you if you like or Facebook if you type his name on Facebook he's very socially reachable yeah yeah. and we'll, we'll yeah. put the link up on the website so people can just uh, click on it yeah yeah I just I did want to ask Mehmet when he's on uh, you know on location there and he's in he's in character. He's, he's dressed up. Uh, the policemen are chained up. You've got all these crazy people on all fours. Uh, what was that experience like once he's actually there? Of course, he knows it's a movie, but what's that what's that feeling like when I, you know everything's going on and all, all you know and there's blood everywhere? And... Uh, he says like when we first went for rehearsal to the location. When he first saw the location, he was so happy because like it was beyond like he was always imagining a type of an altar. Uh, in the in the when he was reading script, but it was beyond his uh, imagination, and he was so super happy to play that role in such an environment. And uh, when people were around him, as he said, he was only focused on his character, and he was just living and enjoying the moment. And I remember, like for my money, when he was like coming down the stairs for the first time, mm -hmm. the the actors being chained the rather experienced actors just like being props in that scene mm -hmm. <laughs> and the naked people the gaffers and the grip and like it's like a, you have an audience of 50 people there like a total of 45 with the the i mean catering and everyone there's like 40 50 people and for me to say okay guys we're going to start playing this now it was it was something to me you know it was very intimidating but i did it and i was super happy but there was a moment like, oh my god, what the hell am I doing here? With all these people are looking at me to like kickstart this now. Uh -huh. so, I just absolutely uh, love the movie, and I really recommend uh, people people to see it, especially you know when uh, either at a festival they can see. I think obviously it's always great to see a movie on the big screen when possible, but if you know not possible, get the DVD and the Blu-ray, and uh, you made a really memorable, just wild film. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. You've been so kind uh, with your comments, and um, I'm super happy. And uh, like, uh, yeah, such a kick-ass thing to be on this podcast. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much. It was wonderful having both of you guys here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's re really, really. Uh, yes. No, I was just saying it was really honored to have you guys here, and th thank you guys both so much. And hopefully, we'll have both of you back for more projects in the future. Yeah. Yes. Let's let's hope for the fingers crossed for that. Uh, Definitely. Hi, this is Heather Langenkamp from A Nightmare on Elm Street, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. <laughs>